So I'd like to welcome you to the COVID-19 Recovery Funding for Healthcare, a live webcast presented by the Catholic Health Association. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jacob and I will be the operator for today's presentation. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. There will be a question and answer portion of the webinar. At any time, you may adjust. You may also submit your questions in writing throughout the presentation by typing them in the Q&A box located on the menu bar. Please note that today's presentation is being recorded and both the recording and the slides will be emailed to you. We are joined today by Lauren Chandler, Chief Operating and Finance Officer for the Catholic Health Association. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Lauren for opening remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jacob. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us uh, today. And uh, on behalf of the Catholic Health Association, I wanna thank you, your colleagues, and your organizations for all that you are doing to care for the community that you serve during this unprecedented time and serving with the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. Before I introduce today's presenters, let us take a moment to quiet ourselves um, before God and have a prayer. Mark, could you advance the slides? Loving God, we come to you full of anxiety about what may happen in the coming days and weeks. Shower us with the peace Jesus promised to his disciples and make us into steady pillars for those around us. In this time of uncertainty and epidemic, wake us up to the reminder that we are not alone. Even as we are asked to keep our distance from others, help us to find ways to reach out to those who need our support. We pray especially for those whose incomes and livelihoods are threatened for the children who have missed meals due to school closures, for those already isolated, lonely, and scared. Loving God, keep them, give them your peace, and through our hands, ensure they have what they need. Sustain, strengthen, and protect all caregivers. Bless them as they offer compassionate care and show selfless courage in the face of risk. Remind us each time we wash our hands in our baptism, you call us to let go of our fears and live in joy, peace, and hope. Amen. Today, we're very pleased to be joined by presenters from Bond Secure Mercy Health and Haggerty Consulting, who will, dis who will discuss federal sources of funding on how to apply for financial assistance in order to protect and sustain operations from your healthcare system. We have two senior executives from Bond Secure Mercy, um, Bond Secure operates 48 hospitals across seven states with 60,000 associates. Ms. Deborah Bloomfield serves as the Chief Financial Officer for Bond Secure Mercy, where she manages the ministry's financial operations, including treasury and investment, supply chain, real estate, and development, and managed care. We're also joined by Bond Secure's Chief Revenue Officer, Billie Jean Mounts, and she oversees the system-wide net revenue and the analytics and revenue budgets, forecast, annual government reimbursement and regulatory reporting. We also have two senior leaders from Haggerty Consulting. Haggerty is an emergency management consulting firm and some of their projects include some of the nation's largest recovery and preparedness projects in more than 30 states, including 9-11, Hurricanes, Katrina, and Sandy. Jeff Bosker, who has significant experience improving safety and regulatory compliance and enhancing the patient experience at a system level is part of our team today. Jeff has helped guide more than a thousand healthcare system employees through the response and recovery operations following 9-11 in Hurricane Sandy. And Mark O'Mara serves as Haggerty's Director of Recovery and has led complex cost recovery operations for municipal entities since Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Mark has overseen the development, execution, and closeout of over $15 billion of federal grants and projects, including approximately $2 billion for hospitals and medical facilities. So I welcome you all. I want to remind our listeners that if you have any questions about the presentation, enter them in the Q&A, and I'll turn this over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you, Jacob. 
we appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, certainly understand that uh, time is limited uh, and that it, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of different needs that are pulling you in different directions. So we really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, we hope to add as much value to your um, needs as possible. So again, please utilize that Q&A function because it does allow us to address specific questions that you may have. Um, with that, I just want to give a quick company overview for who Haggerty Consulting is, because I think that it's really important for you to understand uh, our experience in this space and, and hopefully thereby providing some, some confidence in the information that, that we're providing. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years. We have over a thousand subject matter experts. Uh, we work throughout the country and have managed about $30 billion of federal recovery uh, grant program. So while this is new to many of you, uh, and while COVID-19 is completely unprecedented, uh, we have supported every major disaster through these types of processes uh, since 9-11. Uh, we supported the city of New Orleans after Katrina, uh, the city of New York after Sandy, uh, at FEMA themselves after 9-11. Uh, and in fact, our executive chairman, Brock Long, uh, actually ran FEMA uh, from 2017 to 2019. Today, we would like to cover uh, three main topics. We want to make you familiar with federal funding opportunities, uh, as well as provide a deeper dive into the FEMA Public Assistance Program and provide you some uh, operational next steps on how to track costs and to begin the FEMA Public Assistance Program. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Boxer to talk about COVID-19 federal funding opportunities. Great, thank you, Mark, and good afternoon to all on this call from across the country. As all of you face this most challenging COVID crisis, uh, we wanna provide a overview of the federal funds, both for immediate liquidity for your hospitals and organizations, as well as for long-term recovery that are available to hospitals. There are several federal legislative packages that have been passed for hospital funding to date, uh, starting with the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Act. This made available loans primarily to smaller facilities. Then there was the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This primarily uh, waived many of the insurance requirements and then of course the biggest act that has passed and package comes through the CARES Act, which created and provided $100 billion through the Health and Human Services Provider Fund, as well as the passage of the Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act, which was passed last Friday, that provided an additional $75 billion through Health and Human Services. And given the expected ongoing duration of this event, we anticipate more legislative acts to be passed and future funding. The agencies that are administering and overseeing much of the funds to hospitals and to healthcare organizations come from FEMA, the Small Business Administration, Health and Human Services, which is overseeing the bulk of this money, the CDC, which is providing grants both through states and some telehealth funding as, uh, uh, as well. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is primarily uh, managing uh, the reimbursement side and some of the revenue enhancement dollars that are available. So the immediate needs we know, of course, relate to liquidity and short-term liquidity. And all hospitals, regardless of size, are eligible for the postponement of the employer payroll tax, the FICA tax, the 6.2%. That everyone is eligible. Then there are various different loans that are available, uh, primarily to smaller size hospitals under 500 employees. Uh, those organizations are eligible for the loans put out through the Paycheck Protection Program. Mid-size to larger hospitals are available uh, loans through the Main Street Lending Program. Uh, and organizations, either small or uh, up to mid-size, are also eligible for some initial capital funding dollars through the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. As we move forward through the longer term duration, 
we wanted to give a sense of an overview of all the different funding streams that are available to hospitals and healthcare organizations. Through the Center for Disease Control, there's over $588 million that is made available uh, primarily through existing contracts and relationships that the CDC has with your states. However, hospitals are eligible to receive some of those dollars for any activities, uh, whether it be testing or programs around quarantining, mitigation efforts that are being provided to your communities through the state. The Federal Communications Commission, FCC, has made available over $200 million through the COVID-19 telehealth program. Uh, applicants for this are eligible to receive reimbursement for telehealth programs connected with COVID activity up to a million dollars. The largest bulk of the money, the $175 billion that comes from the CARES Act and from the uh, Paycheck Replenishment Act passed last Friday, this is being administered through the Health and Human Services team. We'll get into the details of that $175 billion shortly. Uh, there's also another $550 million that is being made available through ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Uh, those dollars are being allocated through existing contracts that your hospital has. Uh, through the various different entities and is coordinated uh, by those entities to the organization. $50 million we know has already been made available through that pot. The Department of Education, the DOE, has made available $14 billion. Uh, this is funding for anyone who has a graduate medical education or medical school students uh, eligible to apply for dollars through this funding stream. Uh, and then the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services providing really what we'll call revenue enhancement, uh, suspending the anticipated Medicare, Medicare sequestration. Uh, this really just pushes back the 2% cuts uh, that were supposed to go into effect and pushes it out. The program was originally running through 2029, will now run through 2030, providing 20% Medicare add-on payments to all ICD codes uh, for COVID patients at the, uh, the Medicare rate, additional 20% enhancement. Uh, CMS has delayed the uh, DISRIP cuts that were supposed to go into effect, the Medicaid disproportionate share through hospitals for those facilities that participated in DISRIP medical home programs through your state. The APP program, the Accelerated Advanced Payments, that has been suspended, but was initially being offered through CMS. And then finally, we'll get into further details around the FEMA Public Assistance Program and how that works for hospitals. Here you see the initial allocation of the $30 billion that was put out from the CARES Act. And HHS recognized early on that this distribution really benefited hospitals in non-COVID hotspots. But the goal was to get the money out as fast as possible to help with li liquidity. What we're now seeing is as we move forward, much of these dollars are going to be distributed in a much more targeted fashion. So we have that initial 30 billion that went out and distributed in early April. Uh, we have another $20 billion that was began to go out uh, earlier in the week. It's, it's uh, started on April 27th. We have another $10 billion that was allocated to what's called COVID hotspot hospitals. Uh, much of this money, we know that 50% of these dollars went to facilities in the New York area. Another $10 billion that has started to be distributed to rural health clinics and hospitals, $400 million going to Indian Health Services, another $165 million that is being provided to those rural hospitals that are providing telehealth services uh, to their patients in the community. Uh, and then there's another $30 billion remaining from that initial $100 billion allocation plus that 75 billion supplemental. And what we know right now, um, the 
additional allocation of those funds for uh, patients who are uh, coming in for COVID treatment and testing that are uninsured. The HHS through HRSA has opened up the portal for facilities to begin to enroll and enter information. We'll get into a little bit further on some of those details. And then we're also hearing and seeing that additional dollars will be made available and targeted for skilled nursing facilities, dentists, and Medicaid only providers. I wanna open it up to uh, Debbie and Billy Jean just to comment on some of the activity taking place across the association and your hospitals. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is Debbie Bloomfield. This is a good place for us to pause just a moment uh, and address one of the advanced questions that we had received prior to uh, the presentation. And that has to deal, deal with how we would record the revenues related to the information being reviewed. Uh, grant revenue accounting rules would apply. Uh, and that would mean that as COVID-19 expenses are being incurred, we would recognize the revenue and match that over the same time period. Uh, for Bon Secours Mercy Health, this would start in late March uh, and run through June. In consultation with our external audit partners, we've uh, agreed on how to record this. And I would recommend that everyone, uh, especially those with June 30 year ends, uh, you have a short window here, make sure that you're in alignment with your auditors as to the time period with which you're gonna match these revenues being recorded to your expenses. And keep in mind that there are some clawback potentials with this that you should address as well as to whether a reserve should be applied. In addition to that, if you haven't already, um, studying that tracking policy uh, for how to keep track of all of the expenses and the reporting templates to do so is a key activity, not only for this, but some other things that we'll talk about later in the presentation. Hi, this is uh, Billy Jean Mount, uh, and what I would add uh, also to Debbie's comments is around the tracking of the various pools of funds uh, that Jeff has described, um, and specifically around the clawback provisions. Um, the 20 billion, uh, some of that which was distributed on April 27th, um, is at risk for a clawback as uh, HHS is looking at the first 30 billion plus the 20 billion um, and um, also taking the data uh, that is going to be uploaded um, to do uh, clawback calculations. So um, as Jeff pointed out, the 30 billion was uh, distributed in the fastest way possible. Uh, but this next 20 billion is let's collect, HHS has taken the position of let's collect the um, the data on, on net patient revenue uh, for all providers, and then compare that distribution to what has already been provided. And so that, that gives you some insight into the potential of the reserve uh, that might be required. Um, some of those attestations are gonna be due in the month of May. And so from an operational perspective, you'll wanna make sure that you have tracking of each one of these dollar amounts and the methodologies that are being used to distribute those funds. Um, a lot of the uh, uh, information to upload, um, there's different processes, there's different um, information that has to be provided along the way as uh, you try to tap into these funds. I will address uh, one of the other questions that we got in advance, what, which was around um, how is this going to be recognized in terms of uninsured shortfalls and Medicaid shortfalls and some of our DISH funding mechanisms. And because of the uh, nature of the grant accounting, um, that this is uh, not, not to be offset um, on the cost, Medicare cost reports and I you know, would not um, take the position that these would be offset in those shortfalls. And obviously there'll be more guidance that comes out around that, but that is uh, certainly not, uh, not, not the way I see it uh, happening going forward. So um, Jeff, I'll turn it back over to you, but wanted to uh, at least share our, for our audience today a little bit about how Bon Secours Mercy Health is operationalizing 
um, the, the different uh, tranches. Great. Well, thank you for that context. And uh, we'll go through here and provide some of the general terms and conditions. Uh, uh, Debbie and Billie Jean touched a little bit on, on these. I think I just want to highlight here uh, really the importance of providing those quarterly reports uh, as, as they're due, the first one, uh, July. Uh, as to how some of this money is, is being used to offset uh, expenses or, of course, uh, the, the revenue shortfall, uh, which is the primary purpose, uh, and also just draw your attention to the fact that uh, dollars that are received for uh, any patient care, it's got to be all COVID patient activity, and if you receive an offset, a, a patient claim, you cannot balance bill any further to either insurance or uh, patient or anyone else. Uh, general restrictions around how these dollars could be used for certain salary ranges of employees to offset those expenses. Also pay attention to the, the different changes in the terms and conditions. So uh, th there are some nuances between that 30 billion initial tranche, the 20 billion, the 10 billion, if, if you do receive some of that for COVID hotspot, uh, as well as the, the new allocation of dollars for the uninsured. And here, uh, really what's most important, the, the timeline. Very important to pay attention to 30 days from receipt of those funds that you are going back into the portal and uh, you are are validating and acknowledging that you have received those payments and are accepting those payments. I talked earlier about the bucket for the uninsured and this is just for uh, uninsured patients who are coming to your organization for COVID treatment or for testing. It is important that everyone who is eligible uh, for these dollars goes on today and enters information. If you haven't done so already, go on to the HRSA portal uh, and, and make sure that you validate your taxpayer ID. Uh, this could take one to two business days to process, so important to get that done. Uh, also important to make sure you register for the direct deposit that's being administered through OptumPay. Uh, that could also take some days uh, once you uh, to, to get that set up so you could be able to receive the funds. And then beginning May 6th, that is the date when you could go in and enter uninsured claims going back all the way to February 4th. Again, for treatment and testing for uninsured COVID patients only. So these are the important dates. This is gonna be a first come, first serve allocation. So important to get all this information together and entered by that May 6th opening date. Uh, Debbie and Billie Jean, anything to add? No, I, I, Jeff, I, I think uh, you, you highlighted um, all the requirements. Uh, I just would just remind everyone again that this particular tranche is a first come, first serve um, funding mechanism. So um, getting that advanced registration um, is important and um, you know, being ready um, as close as you can uh, to the May 6th date to submit uh, claims. What I'm not uh, too clear about um, is what that processing is gonna look like um, in terms of getting uh, payments at a patient level back or versus a lump sum payment. And so, um, Jeff, I don't know if you have insight into that question, but uh, that's certainly top of mind for us as we think about how we're gonna track uh, the payments that we do receive for this uh, tranche. Yeah, we, we don't yet have specific details. Uh, there, there have been a couple of information bulletins that have been put out by HRSA, uh, but don't have the specifics as to how that will be sort of allocated on the, the claims data just yet. The, 
the next category that we want to cover is what we'll call a, a revenue enhancement bucket. Uh, and, and this is initially it was set up to uh, CMS wanted to provide uh, prepayments and, and loans to hospitals uh, to help with those immediate liquidity issues. But given the additional dollars that were allocated to health and human services, that was suspended. Uh, and now really the focus of CMS is on the, the payment and uh, the suspension of the sequestration. So uh, for those uh, organizations that sort of budgeted the, the loss of that 2% on Medicare fees uh, can now sort of uh, put that back in, uh, as well as the 20% Medicare add-on payments for all uh, COVID patients that are submitted. And this applies automatically, so nothing needs to be done other than submit your claims the way you normally would. Hey, Jeff. Yes. Um, we have a question, um, pretty relevant right here. Um, is the funding for the uninsured role to rule out COVID in addition to true COVID? Yes, so we don't have any indication that if you provide a test and it's negative on a uninsured patient, that it wouldn't be eligible. Uh, the, the guidance is anyone who comes to your organization for either testing or treatment uh, does not get into the details if that test is negative or positive. Thank you. Jeff, um, this is Billy Jean again. If you could go back one slide. Um, I did want to just reiterate for the audience that the 20% add-on, um, although um, is included as, as uh, Medicare uh, fee-for-service add-on, uh, um, this and the sequester, our expectation is the MA plans would also um, implement this um, as well. And so we have seen in, in reconciling payments that not all of them um, have put this in place yet. Um, and so just something to be aware of that, that you may have to be asking for the payers, your commercial payers to um, put these rules in place. Yeah, that's a good point. So the Medicare Advantage plans, uh, there has not been consistency yet as to how they are responding. We're starting to see and hear a lot more on the private payer side and managing those uh, MA Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, so we, we hope and expect to see that some of that will follow what the Medicare fee-for-service structure is right now for COVID-19 patients. And finally, wrapping up, uh, Mark, on the CMS component, uh, the disproportionate share cuts that were projected to go into effect. Uh, this is for hospitals and, and states that have coordinated and set up medical homes and uh, that were receiving these dollars, but uh, were perhaps forecasting that there was not gonna be additional reimbursement for some of these ongoing programs. Uh, that cut has been suspended. Uh, we're also hearing that there's potential for additional dollars to be allocated uh, to some of these services, just given the overlap of a very vulnerable population in this uh, Medicaid class and uh, dealing with COVID activities. So there's possible for additional revenue enhancement in this bucket. I'm gonna turn it over now to Mark to go through some of the specifics around the FEMA Public Assistance Program. Hey, Mark, Mark, this is Warren. Before you get started, we have a couple of questions that may be relevant to what we just covered. So I'm gonna ask a few of those if you don't mind. Um, this, is a, this is a kind of a longer question, it has a couple aspects to it. Um, Says, can you respond to how overpayments are going to be handled from both an attestation and cash perspective? It's my understanding that funding will be received based on a formula that essentially equals 2% of our 18 revenue, but revenue and tax return data uh, is also being obtained via the general distribution portal. It's not crystal clear if it's inappropriate to attest if a possible overpayment has been received or if attestation is appropriate still and CMS, CMS will do take backs based on revenue tax return information. So a lot there in that question, but I think it's an important one. So I'll leave that uh, for you all to, to tackle. Yeah, so this is Jeff, uh, certainly all really good questions. 
what we do know at this point is that uh, there are dollars being allocated, of course, to OIG, but also to CMS to go through some of this information uh, as this progresses. Right now, the focus is on just getting the dollars out to organizations, uh, but we could expect that there will be review uh, through those two different mechanisms as we move forward. And we anticipate that the process will be very much aligned to how CMS uh, reviews claim submissions uh, in normal operations, uh, but doing that on a much more robust basis for these dollars. So we are advising, of course, everyone to keep close documentation and tracking of the, the claims and how you've allocated some of those buckets of, of funding that has come in from CMS uh, so that in the event that uh, the audit takes place or there's a request for funding, you have all of that lined up and ready to go. Thank you. And then we, regarding these attestations, even some of the, there was a question about who should be performing the attestation? Is there someone that would be more um, apt to do that within an, within an organization? Yeah, generally for the attestations and the portals, they're asking for the chief financial officer of the organization to attest to those funds. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mark, I'll turn it over to you to start working on the, the FEMA part. Great, thank you very much. And please keep the questions coming. So uh, we talked a lot about the different legislations and uh, the federal funding opportunities uh, through them in direct response to COVID-19. Um, FEMA actually has a program called the Public Assistance Program or the PA program. I know that PA means something different in your world than it does in ours, uh, but FEMA calls this the PA program. Uh, so this program is authorized by something called the Stafford Act. And after a major uh, disaster declaration or an emergency declaration, uh, which we now have in all 50 states and U.S. territories, as well as uh, tribal governments, uh, the Stafford Act authorizes funding through this public assistance program to support state, local, uh, and, and other governments, as well as private nonprofits who are supporting this effort. Uh, many of these hospitals fall into that category uh, for private nonprofit or public hospitals, uh, and they are eligible to receive federal funding as a result of their COVID-19 emergency services uh, and support operations. Uh, historically, hospitals underutilize the FEMA Public Assistance Program uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, but the reality is that this is a, a major funding opportunity uh, and unlike all of the previously presented funding opportunities and programs, there is no cap to this. It is not competitive. It is not first come first serve. If you are eligible for receipt of funding uh, based on eligible costs incurred as defined under the Stafford Act, uh, there is no limit to that amount. And, and it, it, you know, you will not have to compete with other hospitals across the country that do this in a timely manner. The, um, the, the biggest point to take away from the FEMA PA perspective when compared to these other funding sources is that there is a federal cost share as well as a non-federal cost share. Uh, so right now the federal government has agreed to pick up no less than 75% of the eligible public assistance costs. Uh, there is precedent for FEMA to actually increase that amount. Uh, most recently, after hurricanes uh, Irma and Maria, uh, they actually increased it to 100% uh, for emergency protective measures, just like COVID-19, uh, for a certain period of time. Uh, there's already been press releases uh, from the current administration uh, discussing the possibility of increasing the federal cost share uh, for specific states and or uh, certain periods of time. Uh, but yet to be determined. That'll likely play out in, in the coming months. Uh, there's also a 25% non-federal cost share. So this differs from state to state. 
uh, some states are statutorily required to pick up some portion of that non-federal cost share. Typically, if it is required, it's 50% of the 25%, so 12.5% total, which would mean that you, what FEMA calls the subrecipient or the applicant, is required to cover 12.5% as well. Uh, some states, like Washington State, for example, has already declared that they're going to cover the entirety of the 25% non-federal cost share. Uh, this will continue to play out as um, this uh, the disaster declaration uh, process evolves. Uh, but again, it's really important for you to note that unlike the other federal programs, you may have up to a 25% cost share of eligible costs in, in, in this uh, in this program. Um, so we all know that COVID-19 is unprecedented for many reasons, uh, but one of the other realities associated with that uh, size and scale and magnitude of, of this disaster is that states and federal governments do not have the resources, the systems, or the procedures uh, to manage this in a standardized uh, in a standard way across 56 different major disaster declarations uh, in every state and territory, right? This, this breaks the system, so to speak. Uh, so what they are doing is they're streamlining their processes uh, and changing their procedures in a manner that will allow them to take the, the number of uh, applicants and, and requests for grant funding that they anticipate as a result of COVID-19. As part of that, they're pushing more of the responsibility for the development, the request, the management, and the eventual closeout of these processes to you, again, what they, they call the applicant, okay? So what you can expect is less support from the state governments and FEMA than you would typically have received if it were a quote unquote typical disaster like a hurricane or a tornado or flooding, which is much more localized and, and just smaller uh, in nature. However, this can also be beneficial. The reality is that this allows you to proactively and strategically lead your own recovery, right? You can drive, drive the, uh, the, the recovery based on your priorities, your timelines, your needs, et cetera. Uh, I would just like to note that you know, we've, uh, we've been doing this for about 20 years and we've seen a proactive recovery and we've seen a reactive recovery where you know, the, the applicant kind of uh, just lets FEMA do it for them, so to speak. And without exception, the entities, the hospitals, the governments uh, that take the recovery as their own personal responsibility and drive this in a, a really proactive and, and thoughtful manner will result in additional funding and decreased timelines. It's just a, a fact of the way the program works. So what is eligible for reimbursement under the category B emergency protective measures allowable in the PA program? They are, they are generally described as the following, right? Any actions or measures taken to eliminate or lessen immediate threat to public health, life, and safety. All right, that's your first rule of thumb. When you ask yourself, is this gonna be eligible for FEMA reimbursement? You should say, is this cost as a direct result of COVID-19 and does it lessen or eliminate threat to public health and safety? Some of those actions, this is not an exhaustive list, but th those that are applicable uh, most directly to you, hospitals, uh, are emergency medical care to include triage and uh, necessary tests and diagnoses, uh, medical treatment, uh, prescription costs, use of uh, special equipment, and, and the costs associated with that, uh, PPE, uh, durable medical equipment, uh, medical waste and, and transport, temporary facilities and expansions. This is a major concern right now, given uh, the, the number of beds that are required. Uh, I'm sure everybody's read or are involved with um, the, uh, the renovations of uh, uh, convention centers and, and different large public facilities for the use as, as temporary hospitals, uh, but it's also to a smaller degree than that, right? Uh, we have many clients that have uh, you know, hospitals that turn their lobbies into uh, ICUs or, or other emergency support areas because there just was no more space. 
the costs associated with that can be reimbursed by uh, the FEMA PA program. Additionally, uh, medical sheltering, uh, the purchase and distribution of food, water, ice, medicine, et cetera, uh, security and law enforcement, and uh, general communications about health and safety. Now, one thing I want to note here is that FEMA eligibility is a multifaceted or a multi-layered uh, review process. So um, you could be doing eligible scope, but it might not be eligible because it's, for example, an ineligible cost. So for example, uh, you may be eligible for reimbursement from FEMA if you decided to uh, build a tent as your intake center to help keep COVID out of the, uh, the hospital facility. Uh, that cost uh, could be reimbursed. However, if you spent $10 million uh, to, to pay somebody to, to put this tent up in your, uh, your parking lot or your, your, your uh, lobby area, FEMA is going to say, well, the scope was eligible, but the cost was unreasonable and therefore it's not eligible. So that's just one example to show you that uh, the details matter, right? Uh, they're going to want to go back into your existing labor policies, insurance policies. They're going to want to understand what your process was for procurement, for um, checking cost reasonableness, uh, you know, making sure that due diligence was um, completed and that, you know, it wasn't um, in any way uh, an exception as a result of federal funding, right? They want to make sure that you're being good stewards uh, of their money. Uh, Mark? Yes. This would be, I think, a great time for Debbie to mention um, some of the accounting policy work that we've done at Bon Secours Mercy Health. Great, Debbie. Okay, Phil and Jean. Uh, thank you. Well, um, early on in this process, we knew the importance of tracking some of these expenses so that we'd be able to do these filings. And so we do have a policy that we are willing to provide to see our, our fellow CHA members. Uh, if it would be helpful to you, if you don't have a written policy or if you're curious and want to compare it to yours, uh, as well as the templates that I had mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, so that you can make sure from an accounting standpoint You've set up, um, in some cases, you, need, you may have needed separate call centers, et cetera, or even new accounts to track things, not only for the stimulus piece that we talked about earlier, but this piece with regard to the FEMA application. And so uh, we'll offer those tools to you. We can get those to Lauren if you think those would be a benefit to you. Great, Billie thank Jean, you. any other points? I know we're running kind of low on time, so I want to turn it back to Mark. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much. The, the last point I wanted to make here is I talked about the general rule of thumb associated with uh, the immediate, you know, or, or the elimination or the uh, reduction of threat to public health, life and safety. Um, the other rule of thumb for you uh, to consider in the eligibility thought process is, is this cost that I am incurring as a direct result of COVID-19. This is essential. So for example, if you have budgeted employees staff time, what FEMA refers to as force account labor, that you would have incurred regardless of COVID-19, that's not going to be eligible. So for example, um, they only pay for your budgeted staff overtime, all right? Uh, now, what they will allow you to do is pay regular time or straight time uh, and overtime of temporary or surge staffing, as well as uh, contractually um, procured staffing, all right? All of their time would be eligible for reimbursement. So this is really important to think about and, and strategically uh, develop a, a plan moving forward to determine how you're going to continue supporting COVID-19 with the understanding that your regular time is likely not eligible for reimbursement through the FEMA PA program. Okay, uh, this program has something called an incident period. Uh, in which they determine what the eligible time frame is for reimbursement. The incident period started on January 20th of this year. So you're actually eligible to recoup funding from May 1 right now, all the way back to January 20th 
as well as in the future. Okay, I'm going to talk about that a little bit now, uh, moving forward. So the uh, the number one thing you can do is track all of your costs. We highly recommend that you use what we call an emergency code or e-coding system in your financial management system. And if you're, you know, a small critical access or rural hospital that your financial management system is a folder, that's fine. Start a new folder, right? Uh, make it for COVID-19. All of your staff costs, all of your contract costs, all of your um, equipment, et cetera, uh, directly associated with COVID-19 should go into that bucket. And you can start breaking them down into those, those subfolders or those, those sub buckets, if you will, um, based on those four uh, uh, criteria. Contracts, staff, equipment, materials. That's how FEMA likes to look at the, at the time. The other reality is the federal government doesn't just take your word for the fact that these are eligible costs. You have to provide a significant amount of documentation to include invoices, contracts, uh, proof of payment, canceled checks, uh, as well as the critical details associated with these as well. The who, what, where, when, and why. They want to know, okay, so you incurred $10,000 in staff time. Who was it? What days were they working? What time were they working? Uh, when did they work and what were they doing and why is it as a direct result of COVID-19? So we strongly urge that you provide standardized uh, tra task tracking in your process for COVID-19. Uh, you probably know better than I do. If you allow each individual employee to write what they were doing into a, a time card, you're going to get uh, unique answers across the board, which could jeopardize federal eligibility because FEMA will go through and read every single one of them. All right. Uh, the second thing that we recommend, and, and this is the, the first step in applying for FEMA public assistance, is creating an account through the FEMA public assistance grants portal. The grants portal is the online system in which you manage your entire FEMA experience, okay? You upload your documentation, you track your costs, um, you know, you get feedback from, uh, from FEMA all through this system, the PA Grants Portal. If you Google it, it'll pop right up. First thing you need to do is register through the Grants Portal. As part of that registration is something called the Request for Public Assistance or the RPA. That is what puts you on the, on the radar for FEMA as well as the state and makes you eligible to start to receive funding through the public assistance program. I would just note very quickly that this program works in this manner. You actually develop the grant. Uh, you provide that to the state for review and approval, who then sends it to FEMA for review and approval, who if FEMA agrees, then writes the check to the state and then the state then writes the check uh, to you, what again, they call the subrecipient or the applicant. So the state emergency management agency plays a major role in this process. Uh, what their role is differs from state to state. Some states are very strong advocates for you. Other states are more of a transactional uh, party throughout this process. Uh, but it's really important that you create collaborative partnership relationships with the state and with FEMA uh, throughout this process. Um, the third step that I would recommend is request expedited funding. So I talked a little bit about the fact that this is a reimbursement program. You have to spend a dollar before FEMA will reimburse you for that or for 75 cents on that dollar. Um, however, there is an exception. FEMA actually allows you to request expedited funding for projected costs that you would reasonably assume to incur in the next 90 days. So right now you could be reimbursed in whole for your previous 90 days, right? January 20th to May 1st, but you can also submit a request for the next 90 days. What FEMA will do is review that if they agree that it's reasonable, if they agree that it's substantiated or justified by um, uh, proper documentation, they'll cut you a check for up to 50% of that. Why 50%? That's the number that FEMA utilizes so that even if you're half wrong in your projection, they don't have to come back and de-obligate funding. Uh, I know that Billy Jean and, and Deborah both talked about this earlier, um, but 
duplication of benefits and risk of de-obligation uh, is an extreme um, reality in this entire process. The Federal Office of Inspector General, or OIG, is being funded through the exact same legislation as, um, as the, the different recipients of this money are. Their sole metric for, for um, uh, success is how much money they're able to claw back, okay? Hey, Mark, um, we yes. need to have some time for some questions. So if you could wrap this up, that'd be great. And we can yeah, move on absolutely. to some questions. I've got one, one more point here. Um, the last thing I, I would recommend is that, uh, you know, this is going to be an administratively burdensome process. That's just the reality. Uh, they are still actually working on Hurricane Katrina 15 years later. Uh, this cost recovery process will be measured in years, uh, not in weeks or months. You need to identify individuals who are going to lead this responsibility, and you need to uh, get subject matter experts and uh, staff augmentation and capacity uh, capabilities to manage this process. Uh, FEMA themselves actually recognize the administrative burden associated with this, and they will give you an extra 5% on top of your eligible costs to manage and administer uh, this program. So what that means is if you have a million dollars worth of loss, FEMA will give you an extra $50,000 to, to manage all of these grants. It's 10 million, it's $500,000, and you have to prove it, you know, it's up to that amount. Uh, but that money can actually be utilized to hire firms like Haggerty Consulting, uh, as well as pay for your own staff time. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren. We really uh, look forward to the Q&A. Great. Thank you. Um, and we'll get to as uh, many questions as we can. Um, the first one is, is really a FEMA-related question. It says, do you also recommend tracking regular time related to COVID, salary, staff time, working, and incident commands? I understand this time would not be eligible for FEMA PA reimbursement, but do you expect these costs will be eligible for other reimbursement funds? Yeah, great question. The answer is absolutely yes. Check, track all of those costs. Couple of reasons. Uh, number one, there might be federal funding opportunities in the future that will pay for that time. Uh, number two, FEMA utilizes that to justify equipment usage as well as any overtime costs. So you know, if you're saying that you're, you're using you know, 2,000 units of PPE, you have to substantiate that you had the staff on hand to even utilize that amount of PPE, and that's one way to do it. And this is a similar question. that We actually have a couple of these. Um, there's a high portion of our staffing costs was keeping staff on to be able to respond to the surge, even though under normal circumstances, we would have flexed or furloughed based on census. Have there been any discussions with FEMA to address this unique element with this pandemic? Uh, the answer is yes. And FEMA does allow pre-positioning of resources and costs associated with that. However, they will still fall back on their budgeted um, employee policy. So if those employees would, would not have been an additional cost, if that was a, uh, a non-COVID related expense that you would have incurred, uh, it would not be eligible. But if you can prove that it was incremental, it was additive to your original budgeted cost, uh, it, it can be eligible. So that could be where like an hours per patient day was a lot higher than what was budgeted because the, the staff was there, but the patients didn't come in. That'd be one way maybe to prove that. Yes, and, and they're going to look at a lot of different things. And again, the devil's in the details. So uh, what FEMA does is actually review your pre-incident labor policy. So what they want to know is what was your labor policy specific to events like this um, that, that was in place prior to the storm? So you can't just retroactively now, not, not the, the storm, the, the, the hurricane, the tornado, COVID-19. Um, so what they, what they do is make sure that you don't have the ability to change that policy midstream, okay? Um, so they will look at the pre-COVID policy to determine whether or not they're going to pay that out. And, and again, so the, the, the devil really is in the details, so to speak. Great. Another question, um, it says, if a provider has received CARES Act funding under tranches one or two, what is the deadline for the required submission to HHS provider relief fund application portal tax return revenue losses info? So this is Jeff. Um, I'm not sure I fully uh, follow the question, but uh, just in general, 
uh, from the date you receive any funding coming in, you have 30 days to go back to the portal to acknowledge and to provide validation and attest to re uh, receiving those dollars. Great, thank you. Jeff, this is Billy Jean. I could maybe clarify, I think, what I think the question is around, I think, the, the second tranche and the submission there to upload the tax returns and um, gather all that data. I don't know there to be a specific timeline to submit that. In fact, I, I think it just behooves us to take, take your time um, in preparing that documentation for the second tranche because they're using that information to redistribute the $50 billion. And uh, so, you know, it's definitely something that you wanna not rush. Um, where on the other hand, as we talked about the uh, um, uninsured claims, that one you want to rush and hurry up and submit. So ho hopefully that answers the question. That's correct. And the other, the other important date just to pay attention to is of course that quarterly submission uh, for how those funds are being used. And uh, all this information, as you go onto the portal, there's sort of a section or a, a link next to it that goes through all the rules and regulations in addition to what we provided in this presentation. Um, one more question I think that we'll hopefully have time for before our, our time ends is for the 20% on add-on, is it based on coding within medical records as defined by the NUBC guidelines? Billy Jean, maybe you could answer that. Oh, coding's a little bit outside of my expertise, Lauren. Okay. So I don't know if I could, but uh, I do um, understand that that, uh, that is the case, um, but you'll certainly want to uh, follow up with your, your HIN departments for you clarification there. Yeah, it's Jeff. I could just add on that 20% is very specific to certain DRGs uh, and it has changed. So it's important to just understand that what those DRGs are and then what those subcodes are, um, whether it be pneumonia or acute respiratory syndrome, uh, they're very specific and in fact um, are, are denying and in, in some cases uh, not paying out uh, if you do not have the specific DRGs. And again, they changed it. So there's date ranges, January to March is one DRG set, uh, and then April 1st, a different DRG for COVID-19. And those coding systems just got updated April the 1st. So Lauren, I still think we're kind of figuring that part out okay. and how to go back and, and recapture even past cases, you know, there's some thought out in the industry that we were probably seeing some of this going back to November. And I think, you know, it just adds an interesting nuance to maybe there's some revenue recovery to go back and, and get that 20% even further. So um, it'll be interesting, I think, to explore it further. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for participating. We did not get to all the questions, but we'll get some answers out there and get those out to everyone that was on the call uh, today. I really appreciate you taking the time. I really want to thank uh, our panelists for taking time out of their busy day to provide us with this information. Uh, and with that, Jacob, I'd like to turn it back over to you. Thank you. And on behalf of the Catholic Health Association, I would like to thank you for participating in today's event. A recording of this event will be sent in an email and will also be posted on CHA's website at www.chausa.org forward slash coronavirus. This concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day.